nonetheless a father of three boys. One thing that I've learned through the years is that boys love to be chased. Okay, they love it when you play with them. They love it when you chase them around the house. Whenever I play the monster and go after them, uh, they squeal with these shrieks of delight, especially when they were smaller. And you know, oftentimes it's this interesting mix of sheer terror and this giddy joy as they explode into this nervous laughter. You know the type of laughter I'm talking about when you're playing with them and you're just having a great time? Uh, some years ago, it was my middle son, he was about three years old, and I was stomping down the hall, and I was playing the monster, and as I pursued him, he ran into our room, the master bedroom, and then he rounded the corner, and he went into the bathroom. And I could tell that he was in the bathroom even before I went around the corner into the bathroom. So I finally made my way into the bathroom, and this is what I found. Okay. And I'm glad I had the sense to snap a picture of it because uh, for me it's a precious picture. Uh, but boys love to be chased. And as I think about this concept of chasing and pursuing, uh, obviously some chases, some pursuits are good. Uh, some chases, some pursuits are bad. Uh, some are bad, right? We, we don't like it when the state patrolman chases us. Uh, that's a bad deal. We don't like seeing those flashing lights in the rearview mirror from the state patrolman. We just, we just sigh and we groan and we go, oh no, this is going to cost a lot of money. Uh, we don't like it when the telemarketers pursue us trying to sell us something, uh, maybe a timeshare. Uh, that, that's a pursuit, that's a chasing after you uh, that is bad. Uh, we don't like it when an ad pops up on Instagram for something that we just looked at in Amazon, right? I mean, that's kind of a creepy feeling, like they're after me. They're watching me. These are bad chases. Uh, some chases are bad, but some chases are good. Uh, we like it a lot when someone we love pursues us. Uh, my wife loves it when I pursue her, when I take the initiative to make special times together and to go out on a date night. She loves it when I pursue her because it shows her that I still think about her, that I still am in love with her and that I'm chasing after her. Some pursuits are good. Uh, most people love it when you visit them in the hospital because one, it shows that you love them and that you're pursuing them, and that you're interested in what concerns them or what involves them most. And I've learned that people who are frustrated or hurting or offended or depressed love it when you pursue them. They love it when you ask them, how are you doing? I can tell that you're struggling. They love it when we take the time to listen to them, download the things that are on their hearts, the things that are weighing heavily on them. We love to be pursued because I think bottom line, it communicates love. It communicates love. It communicates that we matter. It communicates that we occupy a place in the hearts of other people, that we're worth the hassle. We all love to be pursued in a good way. There was a time in David's life described in Psalm 23 when he was being pursued. Go ahead and turn there with me. Psalm 23, he was being pursued in a bad way. His enemies were hunting him like a bird, trying to kill him, trying to destroy him. Uh, this might have been when Saul was after him. It might have been when Absalom, his oldest son, was trying to take over the throne. David called this time the valley of the shadow of death. His enemies were in hot pursuit. But, David says that during this horrible time when death was chasing after him, that someone else was chasing him. Someone who was faster than death. Someone who was more determined than death. Someone whose love was relentless and inescapable. David, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, describes this beautiful chase, this beautiful pursuit in Psalm 23 and verse 6, I'm going to ask you if you're able to please stand as we read 
this section of scripture. The last verse of Psalm 23, I've so thoroughly enjoyed this psalm, I wish there were a seventh verse. But we have it all, all that we need in the first six verses. David says, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You can be seated. Now, note David's journey with me. After David passed from green pastures through the dark valley into the banquet hall of God that we saw last week, he says there's every reason to believe that God's goodness and mercy are going to follow hard after him all the days of his life. Now, the words of David are not only describing his experience with God, but they're also describing the experience of every genuine believer's life journey with God. Psalm 23 is a picture of our pilgrimage from this life to glory. If the Lord Jesus Christ is your shepherd, he restores your soul into right relationship with him. He leads you in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. He's going to make you like Jesus. He leads you through perilous times, through the valley of the shadow of death. He spreads a table before you. He fills your cup to overflowing. He spreads all of this in front of you in the presence of your enemies. And his goodness and mercy pursue you all the days of your life until... He takes you home to be with him. I love what Spurgeon said about this verse. He called it a medicine chest for the soul. Isn't that good? A medicine chest for the soul. It's a feast of comfort and reassurance. Yes, death's shadow is gaining on all of us, but it's not as fast as goodness and mercy. Do you see that? Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. It's a beautiful picture, but I think this concept of follow is actually obscured in the English language. Follow in the English language carries with it this idea of trailing behind or lagging behind, uh, trying to catch up but never quite getting there. Follow means that you're in second place, you're in third place, or maybe you're in 55th place. Follow means that someone or something else is faster than you. Uh, follow is only comforting if what's following you is good and if it arrives in time. Now, what if this verse said, surely goodness and mercy will lag behind me all the days of my life? Now, that wouldn't be comforting, would it? But that's not what follow means here. The word follow is an active word, okay? It's an aggressive word. It's the exact same word that is used in 1 Samuel 26 when David is asking Saul, why are you pursuing me? Why are you trying to kill me? Why does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is in my hands? Follow here is the same word that is used in the book of Joshua to describe Joshua marching through the night with his army in order to overtake the enemy. Now this is a term that speaks of a relentless pursuit to methodically hunt someone down. Do you see what's being promised here? Do you see how altogether wonderful this verse is, if Jesus is your shepherd, then his goodness and mercy are relentlessly hunting you down. He's relentlessly after you. You might be faster than Usain Bolt, but still that's not fast enough to outrun the grace and the mercy of God. You cannot outrun his goodness and mercy. You cannot outlast his goodness and mercy. You cannot hide from goodness and mercy. If you are in the Lord Jesus Christ, his goodness and mercy are going to be relentlessly hunting you down, pursuing you, and it will never, ever stop until you are apprehended. If you are in Christ, goodness and mercy are going to get you. You can't escape. Evasion and escape are impossible. That was Dwight L. Moody, the famous evangelist of the 19th century who was once approached by a woman needing counseling. Uh, two men, she claimed, were following her. She said, when I step onto the trolley, these two men step on. 
When I step off to the trolley, off the trolley, these two men step off the trolley. They follow me everywhere I go. And with this nervous twitch in her neck, she insisted that she had been followed into the office of Dwight L. Moody by these two men. As Moody was talking with her, he could quickly see that this dear woman was suffering from a mental delusion. There was no one following her. But to help put her at ease, Moody told her, these two men who are following you are King David's men. Their names are goodness and mercy. And then he took her to Psalm 23, 6 and showed her, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And she was relieved and exclaimed and she said, that's wonderful. I always wondered what their names were. And that woman left that day with peace of mind, knowing that it was the goodness and mercy of God following her. Let me tell you a little bit about these two characters, goodness and mercy. And it was interesting, after the first service, someone shared with me that they have a dog and a cat, and their names are goodness and mercy. Uh, Goodness and mercy are interesting characters. Goodness is describing how God promotes and produces and protects and enhances the lives of his children, how he relentlessly does this. And mercy is perhaps the most beautiful word in the Hebrew language, if not all languages. Uh, This idea of mercy, this word mercy in the Hebrew is actually hesed. Hesed, it speaks of God's loyal love. It speaks of his covenantal love. It speaks of his never giving up, never stopping, never ceasing, never ending, always and forever love that will see to it that all of his promises are kept in meticulous detail in the lives of his children. Philip Keller, a sheep rancher turned pastor, wrote about this verse. He says, not only is this a bold statement, but it is somewhat of a boast an exclamation of confidence in the one who controls David's career and destiny. How many Christians actually feel this way about Christ? How many of us are truly convinced that no matter what occurs in our lives, we are being followed by the goodness and the mercy of God? Of course, it is very simple to speak this way when things are going well, but what about when my body breaks down? When my job folds and there's no money to meet the bills? What do I say when suddenly, without good grounds, friends prove false and turn against me? These are the sort of times that test a person's confidence in the care of Christ. When my little world is falling apart and the dream castles of my ambitions and hopes crumble into ruins, can I honestly say, surely yes, goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. You see, when we're going through the valley of the shadow of death, when the windshield of our lives is pitted with pain, when it's just absolutely shattered with fear and disappointment in God, when God doesn't seem to be giving us what we want, it would be easy to doubt this promise. It would be easy to doubt this promise when you lose your job, when the lab results come back and they're not what you were hoping for when you're struggling with your new classes, when you're struggling with a particular professor, it can be hard to believe that goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. It's hard to believe that they are in hot pursuit. At all times, but especially these times, we need to walk by faith. We need to rehearse God's past faithfulness. We need to remember those times of his faithfulness, and we need to take these past occurrences of his faithfulness and we need to remember them and apply them in the present to draw strength. We need to remember the times that we were lost and afraid. And then, lo and behold, the rod and the staff showed up. We need to remember the times that we were surrounded by our enemies. And then, lo and behold, the table showed up. In the presence of our enemies, the cup was filled to overflowing. The scriptures are very clear that we all have to go through many trials and struggles and tribulations to enter the kingdom of God. The suffering are part and parcel of the Christian life, that if you're following Jesus in faithfulness, 
You will suffer. But the promise here is that you will never walk alone. God himself and his goodness and mercy will be in hot pursuit. Whatever you're going through, you can be confident that every day of your life, goodness and mercy are with you each and every step of the way. There will never ever be a day in your life when the goodness and the mercy of Jesus are not immediately present. Okay, the love of Jesus, the mercy of Jesus is going to be nipping at your heels all day, every day for the rest of your life. Isn't that good news? Isn't that worth rejoicing in this morning? And to make the promise even sweeter, what does David say? He says, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. What does David mean by house of the Lord? In David's day, the house of the Lord was what? It was a tent. Okay, it was the tent of the meeting, this portable tabernacle, this portable temple that would move around in the wilderness. So, question, as David lived before the brick and mortar temple was built, what does he mean when he says, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever? Is he saying, I'm going to live in the tent of the meeting forever? Is he saying that I'm going to die and be buried in the tent of the meeting so that after that the tent of the meeting can't leave because then I'll I'll be left behind? No, I don't think so. I don't think that's the idea. Listen to Psalm 27.4. David says, one thing I have asked of the Lord, that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, for he will hide me in his shelter in the day of trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent. He will lift me high upon a rock. Now, David here is using house of the Lord or temple to refer not ultimately to a physical location, but to the place where there's unbroken fellowship before the face of God. Since the first coming of Jesus, we focus on what? The heavenly temple, the eternal dwelling place of God where we will see him face to face and we will commune in his presence forever. Now, in a sense, David is going back with this verse, verse 6, and he's adding richness and fullness to the entire psalm. It's richer and more wonderful than we ever imagined. What's really being said is something like this. The Lord is my shepherd forever. I shall not want forever. He makes me lie down in green pastures forever. He restores my soul forever. I shall fear no evil forever. Forever. He leads me in the paths of righteousness forever. He spreads a table before me in the presence of my enemies forever. I will live in unbroken fellowship before the face of God forever. Let me ask you if you are a follower of Jesus, are you starting to see just how loved you are, how accepted you are, how secure you are? in the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you sensing how comprehensive these promises are? They're meant to be an anchor for our souls so that whatever problem we're going through in life, we can see that Jesus is greater. That our problems would become smaller and smaller and Jesus would become greater and greater. And if you're not a follower of Jesus, I would encourage you, why would you wait another day? Why not right now, this very moment, put your full faith and confidence in him as saving Lord? Because you can be this loved. You can be this secure. You can experience this type of relationship with the one who made you, the creator of the entire universe. And you can be ready for anything that life throws at you. I love the way John Piper Describe the promise of verse 6. He says, imagine yourself driving nonchalantly down the freeway when all of a sudden you see red flashing lights in your rear view mirror. And for some reason you make the irrational decision to push the gas pedal instead of the brake. You roar down the freeway at 100 miles per hour trying to get away from the state trooper. And as your sense of guilt mounts, all of the faults of your life start popping up out of your unconsciousness where they had just lain waiting to make you miserable. All the while, you remember that just one more ticket and your license will be revoked, and you won't be able to take that hard-earned vacation to Miami with your wife. 
but your car simply does not have the power to overpower the highway patrol cruiser, and finally you're forced over. And you sit there trembling as the officer approaches. You roll your window down, and the officer says, got a little bit of a guilty conscience, huh? Then he reaches into his pocket, and he pulls out a wallet, and he says, that motel you just left asked me to catch up and bring your wallet to you that you left on the counter. So you feel like an utter fool, you reach out and you take the wallet. And he says, oh, there's another thing. Uh, They had a drawing for a sweepstakes that you entered into, that you registered for at the hotel last night, and you won a free trip to Miami (laughs) for you and your wife. And just when you're breathing easy, the officer says, now you're under arrest and you'll have to come with me. So you leave your crummy little car and you get into the back of the patrol car and you head off, but he doesn't say where you're going. Soon you realize that you're not headed to the courthouse, you're not headed to the jail, that you're driving out into the country. And you keep driving out into the country when all of a sudden he turns into a magnificent estate through a huge gate, drives under these 200-year-old oak trees toward this beautiful mansion ahead. And you ask, where in the world are we? And he says, this is my place, and I would like to have you live with me forever. And that's your place right down there by the river among the willows. It's free. And I'm going to go now, and I'm going to get your wife. I'm going to get your children. I'm going to get your loved ones so that they can come and be where you are and where I am. And hopefully they won't try to run away too. If you belong to Jesus, you will never ever escape his faithful loving care. It's impossible. No matter where you go, Jesus will follow you with his loving, faithful care. David knew what it was like to be pursued, to be chased to be hated, and to be hunted. But no man, not Saul or Absalom, chased him as persistently and as effectively as the Lord did. And you too know what it's like to be chased by the enemies of death and disease, fears, failures, disappointments, struggles, and setbacks, worries, and uncertainties. But loved ones, no one chases you as relentlessly, as consistently as the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is your good shepherd. Jesus is your banquet host. Jesus is your highway patrolman overtaking you with goodness and mercy forever. Therefore, again, let no unfrightenty, uncertainty frighten you. Let no ambiguity keep you up at night. If you belong to Jesus, you will never ever escape his faithful, loving care. Let me ask you, what's weighing most heavily on your heart right now? What's keeping you up at night? Your health, loneliness, finances, uh, relationships, School, career, future, marriage, or lack thereof, what fear, what weight, what uncertainty do you need to relinquish to him right now and say, Lord, you are my shepherd, you are my banquet host, you are my highway patrolman that overtakes me with goodness and mercy. The psalm says, I shall not want He will see to it that you have what you need when you need it. The psalm says, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. There is no situation that you could face in life or in death, real or imagined, where the promises of Psalm 23 are not completely covering you. You are complete in him. So stop trying to figure it out on your own. Stop looking to another provision. Stop looking to something else. Stop looking to something you can do in your own power to meet the needs of your life. You have him. He's here and his name is Jesus. 
He is your good shepherd. He is your banquet host. He is your highway patrolman overtaking you with goodness and mercy forever. If you belong to Jesus, you will never, ever escape his faithful, loving care. Let me ask you a question. Is there any better way to end this sermon today, our time together in Psalm 23, than the Lord's Supper? If you think about it, coming to the Lord's table together? The answer is no, because as we come to this table, we remember the body and the blood of Jesus. His body that was given for you and for me, his blood that was shed for you and for me. Why? So that we might have a new covenant. This cup is called what? It's called the new covenant in his blood. It is the sign, excuse me, the symbol of the new covenant. The cup, the blood of Jesus. Now, speaking of a new covenant, Jeremiah the prophet conveys God's words to us. God says, I will make with them an everlasting covenant. How long does the covenant last? It's forever, it's an eternal covenant. I will make with them an everlasting covenant. What is it? That I will not turn away from doing good to them. Now let me ask you a question. When the God of the universe makes an everlasting covenant and his promise is to never ever stop doing good to those who hope in Jesus, to those who love Jesus, isn't that something we should be excited about? And I will put the fear of me in their hearts that they may not turn from me, and I will rejoice in doing good to them. The everlasting covenant that Jeremiah speaks of is the new covenant that was established when Jesus Christ died, when his body was given for you, when his blood was shed for you. Now, to put this in New Testament terms, we would put it like this. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? See, the argument Paul is making is from the greater to the lesser. Okay, if God has already given us the greatest thing in the Lord Jesus Christ, the greatest gift he could give us, his son, won't he then also give us every other lesser thing that we need to live a godly Christian life? The answer is yes. God is so committed to doing good to you that he gave his son and he broke Jesus over the cross. Blood poured out. Body broken for you and for me. Why? So that we could have this promise that he will never ever stop doing good to us. Surely, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And it's all because of Jesus. Lord, thank you. Thank you for Jesus, good shepherd, banquet host, and highway patrolman, overtaking us with goodness and mercy forever. Father, thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you for all of the promises of Psalm 23, which are our only comfort in life and in death. And as we come to the table to remember the death of Jesus today, would you impress upon us how absolutely sure all of your promises are? Would you bring us comfort and hope and joy and perspective that empowers us to triumphantly persevere over anything life throws at us? Would you strengthen all of us in our present circumstances? And God, would you spiritually nourish us and make us strong in Jesus as we partake of the bread and the cup today? It's in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.